Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Danielle Conway, the Dean and Donald J. Farage Professor of Law at Penn State Dickinson Law. She is a leading expert in procurement law, entrepreneurship, intellectual property law, and licensing intellectual property. Dean Conway joined Dickinson Law in 2019 after serving four years as Dean of the University of Maine Law School of Law and 14 years on the faculty of the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she was the inaugural Michael J. Marks Professor of Business Law. Conway is the author or editor of six books and case books, as well as numerous books, chapters, articles, and essays. Her scholarly agenda and speeches have focused on, among other areas, advocating for public education and for actualizing the rights of marginalized groups, including indigenous peoples, minoritized peoples, and members of rural communities. Dean Conway is the co-recipient of the inaugural Association of American Law Schools Impact Award, which honors individuals who have had a significant positive impact on legal education or the legal profession. She also serves as one of three co-chairs of the Select Penn State Presidential Commission on Racism, Bias, and Community Safety. In 2016, Conway retired from the U.S. Army in the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after 27 years of combined active reserve and National Guard service. Conway gave a talk titled Practicing Anti-Racism Unapologetically, using Professor Derek Bell's thesis of the permanence of racism as inspiration for building an anti-racist law school, legal academy, and legal profession on February 1st, 2023, as this year's Derek Bell Lecturer. The annual Derek Bell Lecture honors Bell, who from 1980 to 1985, was the first African-American to serve as Dean of the UO School of Law. He wrote extensively about race in the United States and challenged the academic institutions he served to commit to diversity. Thank you, Danielle, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. I'm honored to be here, especially to deliver the Derek Bell Lecture. So first, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in the law. Well, you know, I got interested in the law because of misinformation. Uh, when I was eight years old, I thought, oh, I wanna be a lawyer like Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Turns out he wasn't a lawyer but my path was set. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned in the intro, um, you retired from the US Army in the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after 27 years of service. How has military service impacted and, and helped to shape your approach to law and leadership? It's a wonderful experience to have spent so much time in service to my country. It's, it's been an important way to learn how to build community, how to be with people, also how to, to perform a mission and to do things that are necessary and significant for people and for organizations in need. I was fortunate to have very specialized training in the United States Army. And so I did things that were just outrageously spectacular. And it prepared me for more spectacular work as a dean of a law school. And so I have so many uh, comrades, friends, family members who have also served. And I consider them to be just shining lights for everything that I do, that I did, and that I hope to do in the future. So you you spent a, a period of your career practicing law, and then you came to the academy. What what prom prompted you to switch gears and and move to the academy? That is such an insightful question. You know, uh, when I completed my active duty service, I had experience with government contracts and intellectual property. So I'm not ashamed to say that I was courted by private law firms. Uh, but in that courting, um, I just, I, I didn't feel as though it was reaching my soul with the kinds of work that I had anticipated a lawyer doing. Remember, Martin Luther King was my inspiration for going to law school, even if he wasn't a lawyer. And so I didn't necessarily see the intersection of those two things, working at a private law firm, but also working 
for justice in a social, cultural, economic, and political framework. So I did something really wild. I applied for a legal research and writing position to learn how to teach law. And it was the best decision of my life. I was mentored by a woman who was ahead of her time in developing the field of legal research and writing, Jill Ramsfield. And she made me love teaching. And I married that love of teaching with the love of the law and with a love and desire to help facilitate justice with people who are like-minded. So your that comment really brings me to my next question. So as we mentioned, you are here to give the Derek Bell lecture at U of O. Um, obviously everything you've just said about your inspiration and, and the way you approach being a Dean of a law school sounds very much like Derek Bell to me. So can you say a little bit about how Derek Bell's scholarship and, and his example has, has influenced you? Absolutely. I'm one of those people who never had the opportunity to meet Derek Bell in person, to be in his sphere, to be part of his, his collective, except for what I have learned on my own and through the help of others. But I will say this, when I read Derek Bell's books and I look at his history, there's so many parallels. He was a Korean War veteran serving in the United States Air Force. He did not go to what are termed elite schools. He went to public schools and he learned the law in those institutions. He graduated at the top of his class, but could not access opportunities, even being a standout student. And he took circuitous roads to the academy as I did. And so the more I got to learn about his path, the more I understood that my path was valid. And so he became an inspiration, as you can see in the title of the talk, because even with the obstacles and challenges that he faced, he succeeded in fine fashion doing the social justice work that we have needed and we continue to need today. So I look at him as an inspiration, even though I've never had the, the opportunity to be touched by the man in person. So um, in 2020, uh, Penn State Dickinson Law faculty passed a resolution adopting an anti-racist approach to legal education and began to implement a series of initiatives to create that anti-racist approach. First, tell us how does structural inequity manifest in law schools? Why, why is this anti-racist approach needed in law schools? So I'll be talking the, during the, the February 1st presentation exactly about that connection. So fantastic question. Anti-racism is explicitly detailed in the 14th Amendment and is a function of the Reconstruction Amendments in total. And so the idea of anti-racism is actually the through line to a multicultural American democracy. If it's a through line, it's actually a line that we should be following in both legal education and in the legal profession. So our institutionalized legal education enterprise has not yet adapted that through line in how we teach, who we teach, and what we teach. And so in fact, I consider it a constitutional mandate to bring anti-racism to the fore and to talk about it explicitly, just like it was intended by that 19th century public who fought so hard to bring the possibility of a multiracial, multicultural, gender-recognizing new 
way of being in this world. So tell us about some of the ways that Dickinson Law is implementing an anti-racist curriculum. It has been a phenomenal journey with my colleagues uh, at Penn State Dickinson Law. And when I say colleagues, I mean students, staff, faculty, and administrators. None of us having expertise in the area of race, racism, and the law, but all of us promising to develop a knowledge base and to co-create together a course that would help us access the knowledge of anti-racism and apply it. And so what we did was learn first what we did not know and spent an entire summer doing teaching and learning workshops to understand critical pedagogy, to understand uh, <coughs> race, racism in the law, uh, to understand the, the various foundations for an important study of the relationship of race and law to society. And after that, we then got together collectively as a group, not one person, not a siloed um, understanding of how to roll this out, but as a group. And so how do we collectively implement this? So we created a modular course where all of those stakeholders, all of those community members I listed were engaged in teaching. And we approached it every module as a teaching and learning exercise. That then carried through to other features of the curriculum. So we then, after learning how to implement that, what we call the race and equal protection of the laws course, we then began to see how to embed it in other courses. We changed our policies and our practices in the law school. So for example, as Dean, I have the privilege of evaluating my faculty. And so in evaluating my faculty, I asked them, what kinds of innovations have you engaged with to bring anti-racism into the classroom? And we talk about those as well as other things uh, in, that, that deal with the evaluation. We also uh, looked at how we reperform a function of delivering discount rates and scholarship dollars in the admissions phase. So in, in essence, we looked at every function of the law school to see how we could embed these anti-racist practices and policies so that we could continue to learn from them, to continue to innovate, and continue to implement. And it is an iterative process and it's a never ending process. And that's really the lesson I think that Derek Bell leaves us. So you, you're, you're not only involved in implementing this anti-racist curriculum at Dickinson Law, but you're also interested in spreading the word. And so you are editing a book series called Building an Anti-Racist Law School Legal Academy and Legal Profession. Tell us about that series. Exactly. Thank you for that. So um, the work that we were doing became recognized by the University of California Press. And I met with senior editor there, Moira Rossner, and she said, you know, hey, you should really think about doing a book. Make me a, a book proposal. Get a book proposal to me. So I got a book proposal to her. Uh, but in the writing of the book proposal, she called me back and she said, you know, I've been thinking deeply about this. And this is not a book proposal. This is a book series. And here's what I think you should be doing. So I got to work rewriting that, that proposal to make it a series proposal. And so the way I thought about it was as a collectivist effort. So instead of it being a Penn State Dickinson Law book or book series, I, I thought, how can we bring this to the entire legal academy? And so instead of having only a, a number of writers, we put out a huge call to the legal academy and we asked people, we don't care what you're doing in the legal academy or outside the legal academy, we want you to contribute. So we now have over 130 chapter author, author, uh, authors, we have editors and co-editors, 
We have systems designers because a function of the work is to learn systems design, design thinking for human centered uh, problem solving. And so we have so many people involved in this project from over 60 organizations. And we've created a structure where we write as a collective, learn from each other, we ideate and we prototype and we go back and we think about gaps and how we fill those gaps in the series. And it's, it's just become a coalition of anti-racist writers who want to see this implemented, not just at one law school, not just at 10 law schools, but at all 200 law schools. So a, a related effort to spread this word is your work with the Association of American Law Schools Law Dean's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project. Tell exactly. us about that project. That, that was actually the inspiration for the systems design for the book series. So we were all uh, paralyzed. We were all violently, violently shaken to our core by the public lynching of George Floyd. And we see we're dealing with it again today with Tyree Nichols. But I knew that I couldn't deal with that violence and harm on my own. So I reached out to four Black women law deans who I've come through the academy with. And I asked them, how do we support one another? How do we get a message through to the legal academy that this is not an individual law school or an individual person's problem to bear. This is all of our problem to bear. And so using this systems design approach, we came up with this website that was built on an iterative process to learn, to listen, to lead, to audit, and then to test solutions for what law schools can be doing to disrupt and dismantle systemic racial inequality. And so within about four days of work, we produced the Law Dean's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project. And it was a, it was a journey that had I not taken, I know that I would not be as strong, as courageous, as cared for in this work as I am today. So you've mentioned a couple of times uh, the importance of taking a systems design approach to remediating legal education. For, tell us first how you describe what a systems design approach is and why that's the approach that makes sense to take. Sure. So I'll start with the second question first. So systemic racial inequality is just built on a system that was designed to dehumanize a cohort of people based upon a scriptive discrimination. So if you have a system that is designed that way, at least two things need to happen. You must dismantle that system and then you must recreate a system that pushes for systemic equity instead of systemic racial inequity and oppression. And so I took what I learned from my time in the military about systems design and design thinking for networks and structures. And I said, why can't we do that here? And it, it's a difficult challenge to do systems design for the delivery of something that's not a product. But I said, we're up to the task. And so we brought those tenets of systems design over to what is essentially a hybrid social justice service, meaning developing a system to dismantle systemic racial inequality and interlocking systems of oppression. And so we look at the user, we look at defining that user's problem, we then ideate or brainstorm about how to address specific needs that that user has. And then we prototype various uh, solutions and then we test them and get feedback. And so if that is done iteratively, say in a law school or in a law firm or in a hospital, 
then there is a constant co-creation of solutions for people, for, for example, who are so far away from the power center of that system that we begin solving those problems first and then continue iteratively to solve another set of problems. It's getting people in the habit or practice of always going back to the centralization of humanization, humanization of a process. So one of the structural problems, which is um, endemic in the academy and in, and, and in law schools, is the challenge of attracting and retaining underrepresented faculty and students. So how, how can law schools address that systemic problem? There's so many ways to address it. And if we use systems design, we, we go right to the user. So if we think about those who occupy positions that are outside of what the power structure has defined as eligible for this kind of work, that's one way to begin thinking about it. Who decided in this system of exclusion that a certain type of individual from a certain type of school, from a certain type of discipline is really the only eligible teacher and learner who should be in the enterprise. So that's one way to get at it. Another way to get at it is to think about how we actually engage those who are already in the pipeline. Are we asking them to be something that they are not? Are we asking them, them to be inauthentic teachers? Are we asking them to model themselves after the dominant white patriarchy? If we are, we need to disrupt that. If we do just even these two things, we then have an opportunity to bolster the authenticity of that voice and then have access to the people in those networks who know those folks who are already in our pipeline. We get people to give us uh, references, give us life-affirming uh, life uh, assignments to relate to people in different networks. And then we open up our own creativity. Instead of thinking we only have to go in one direction, we now permit ourselves to go in many different directions. And I call it life affirming because it, it ultimately is the practice of a humanize, human, humanizing process to say there's got to be more expertise and talent that we do not include in the enterprise. So you've spoken quite eloquently about the ways in which your trying to spread the word to other law schools. But it's also clear to anyone who reads the newspaper or listens to the radio today that one of the big challenges is trying to communicate the value of, of anti-racism and anti-racist education to the public and to policymakers. Mm -hmm. what, what, how do you see that problem and what, what role do you think that law schools and law school deans have in trying to make that case? First, I think we have to be in the habit of actually talking about anti-racism. And so I'll just give you a wonderful example. I met two people on my way to Eugene, Oregon, a place I had never been in my life. And so I fly in, it's sunny, it's beautiful, it's green. But before I get here, I'm in San Francisco and I meet a gentleman. He sits down next to me, Jerry, and he starts talking with me. He's like, hey, you're headed to Eugene, what are you gonna be doing? And I tell him, oh, I'm going to be talking about the 14th Amendment and anti-racism and building an anti-racist law school. And he was like, oh, my God, that sounds exciting. Jerry is a uh, Hawaiian Filipino man who lives in Napa Valley. And he's like, tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, it was and, and I almost missed my boarding because we were just so enmeshed in this conversation. OK, as if that weren't enough. I get off the plane in Eugene and I'm waiting for my baggage and this lovely lady Wendy comes up. Hey, how you doing? I was like, hey, how are you? Love your glasses. And this is a nice, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a conversation starter. And so we're talking and she, what are you doing here in Eugene? And I give her the same thing. So, you know, instead of sort of not engaging, 
I totally leaned into engaging. She then starts talking to me about her family situation and you know how she wants to be a part of anti-racism and she's never heard it put that way before. So the point I'm, I'm making here is we have to be comfortable, knowledgeable, and then willing to talk about these subjects. And this is how you build a collective, one person at a time, one unit at a time, one discipline at a time, one organization at a time. So one of the places where this um, argument or this struggle is happening is in the courts of the United States. And as you well know, that's a, a really complicated context at our in our moment, as, you know, especially given the, the composition of the Supreme Court, but at, in all these courts um, along uh, down the line. What kind of role do you think the courts are going to have in this process, if any role at all? So our courts uh, are our courts are at an inflection point. You see that President Biden is having success nominating more judges at the district court and the circuit court levels who represent our society. You saw the Supreme Court. Uh, nomination become mired in misinterpretation and mischaracterization of a scholar and a jurist at the highest levels of intellectual rigor. And so you see, quite frankly, what is at issue here? And when the courts are engaging in anti-Blackness, we have to say it. We have to talk about that. When our uh, colleagues in the legal academy are engaged in anti-Blackness, you have to say it. And right after you say it, everyone, I don't care whether you read it or studied it, should be articulating the 14th Amendment, everyone. Everyone should be talking about that. And everyone should be talking about the context and the history of that 14th Amendment. I don't care if you are assigned the role of maintenance engineer. You need to know the 14th Amendment. And that's why the work we're doing at Penn State Dickinson Law is so important because everyone is involved. So everyone in that building is going to know something about the 14th Amendment so that we can have real conversations, so that we can have real uh, arguments and disagreements based upon fact. So those those who, who were arguing about the 14th Amendment in the 19th century, they were arguing about how broad or how narrow it should apply. Those are the things they were arguing about. No one was confused. No one was ever thinking we weren't talking about formerly enslaved black people. Everybody knew that's what we we're talking about. Women were talking about how are we included or not included in the 14th Amendment. So we have to be realists and honest about what was being talked about. And that's how we address the politicization of what is occurring at the Supreme Court. But we also need to support our executives' efforts to make the judiciary representative of our society. So another area of misinterpretation and misunderstanding that's rampant right now is around one of the concepts that Derek Bell was really foundational for, which is critical race theory. Um, tell us a little bit about how you think about that problem, that is to say the, the politicization and the misunderstanding and the mischaracterization in our public discourse, in particular in certain states around critical race theory. 
it's funny, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I really live my life uh, in some ways anecdotally and not theoretically uh, because I do enjoy being with people. And I was with uh, in Las Vegas before coming here, right before coming here with a friend who I dearly love and respect. And he um, graduated from West Point and he was talking with me about, you know, all of the issues that they were having at West Point with critical race theory. And, you know, I, I said, hey, you know, why don't you tell me what, what book you're, you're reading, right? And, and he told me the book that he's reading. I was like, oh, that's not the book you should be reading. And then I gave him a list of books. And then I talked with him about critical race theory in a context that I thought he would appreciate. He had gone to law school at, in the 70s as one of the only military folk in the class. And so I asked him, I said, how did you feel when you were in that class during that time period, right? Anti-Vietnam, right, sentiment. And he said, I felt quiet and I felt like I couldn't contribute to the class. Well, you know what I did? I connected that to critical race theory and how we think about students who have been excluded from classes because of their race, because of their gender, because of their sexual orientation, because of their identity, and say, should those students like you be made to feel silence in the classroom and not be able to theorize about your lived experience in relation to law and social power? And he was like, well, no. I was like, ooh. I think you know what critical race theory is now. <laughs> That's a great story. So um, we're just about at the end of our time. This will be my last question. So the work that you're engaged in is vital, but it's also intense. How do you keep yourself on an even keel? How do you, how do you keep positive? Well, first of all, I thank you for that question, Paul, because we need to each be asking ourselves that. And I am a Black woman. And I am married to a immigrant who is naturalized U.S. citizen from Ghana. And we have a black son who is 11 years old. And I fight bouts of paralysis. You know, I, I honestly, I feel sorry for my son on so many levels. But the, the, the thing I feel sorry is for him is he'll never, he'll never know how not to be without me because I'm not letting him go. I mean, I can't, if I can't trust, it's harmful to all of us, right? But my poor son will never let me see him go because I have to protect him, right? So I need people like you to ask me that question and to, to come and hug me and to say, Danielle, it, it will be okay. We will be in the struggle together. I need to hear that. I need people to come up to me and just hold me tightly. And we do that in the building. And I make sure like, you know, I ask people, I don't just come running up and hugging people just, you know. But, but I need that kind of connection with people. I need those Jerry's and those Wendy's from the airport to, to put their hand on my shoulder and say, keep going. Well, um, if I could put my hand on your shoulder virtually, I would do that, but please keep going. Thank you, Danielle, for speaking with us today. It's been a real pleasure to, and a privilege to speak with you. Thank you, Paul. I've been speaking with Danielle Conway, the Dean and Donald J. Farage Professor of Law at Penn State Dickinson Law. Conway gave a talk titled, Practicing Anti-Racism Unapologetically, using Professor Derek Bell's thesis of the permanence of racism as inspiration for building an anti-racist law school, legal academy, and legal profession on February 1st, 2023, as this year's Derek Bell Lecturer. Thanks so much for watching.